بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters إن شاء الله the best thing with which we can start our gatherings is the recitation of the Holy Quran to be recited by our dear brother Sayyid Ahmed Al Musawi. Let's welcome him with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. صلوا على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله يدافع عن الذين آمنوا إن الله لا يحب كل خوان كفور أذن للذين يقاتلون بأنهم ظلموا وإن الله على نصرهم لقدير الذين أخرجوا من ديارهم بغير حق إلا أن يقولوا ربنا الله ولولا دفع الله الناس بعضهم ببعض له الدمت صوامع وبيع وصلوات ومساجد يذكر فيها اسم الله كثيرا ولينصرن الله من ينصره إن الله لقوي عزيز الذين إن مكناهم في الأرض أقاموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة وأمروا بالمعروف ونهوا عن المنكر ولله عاقبة الأمور وَإِنْ يُكَذِّبُوكَ فَقَدْ كَذَّبَتْ قَبْلَهُمْ قَوْمُ نُوحٍ وَعَادٌ وَثَمُودٌ وَقَوْمُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَقَوْمُ لُوطٍ وَأَصْحَابُ مَدْيَنٍ وَكُذِّبَ مُوسَى فَأَمْلَيْتُ لِلْكَافِرِينَ ثُمَّ أَخَذْتُهُمْ فكيف كان نكير فكأي من قرية أهلكناها وهي ظالمة فهي خاوية على عروشها وبئر معطلة وقصر مشيد أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَ الْأَبْصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَ الْقُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ ويستعجلونك بالعذاب ولن يخلف الله وعده وإن يوما عند ربك كألف سنة مما تعدون وكأي من قرية أمليت لها وهي ظالمة ثم أخذتها وإلي المصير 
قل يا أيها الناس إنما أنا لكم نذير مبين فالذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم مغفرة ورزق كريم والذين سعوا في آياتنا معاجزين أولئك أصحاب الجحيم وما أرسلنا من قبلك من رسول ولا نبي إلا إذا تمنى ألقى الشيطان في أمنيته فينسخ فينسخ الله ما يلقي الشيطان ثم يحكم الله آياته والله عليم حكيم ليجعل ما يلقي الشيطان فتنة للذين في قلوبهم مرض والقاسية قلوبهم وإن الظالمين لفي شقاق بعيد وليعلم الذين أوتوا العلم أنه الحق من ربك فيؤمنوا به فيؤمنوا به فتخبت له قلوبهم وإن الله لهادي الذين آمنوا إلى صراط مستقيم ولا يزال الذين كفروا في مرية منه حتى تأتيهم الساعة بغتة أو يأتيهم عذاب يوم عقيم الملك يومئذ لله يحكم بينهم فالذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات في جنات النعيم والذين كفروا وكذبوا بآياتنا فأولئك لهم عذاب مهين والذين هاجروا في سبيل الله ثم قتلوا أو ماتوا ليرزقنهم الله رزقا حسنا وإن الله لهو خبير وإن الله لهو خير الرازقين ليدخلنهم مدخلا يرضونه وإن الله لعليم حليم صدق الله العلي العظيم أفلح من صلى على محمد وآل محمد Sent Sayyidina for this beautiful recitation. Let's all give him a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. This eve we commemorate Imam Hussein's brother, trustee, and emissary, Muslim ibn Aqil. Muslim was unwavering in his faith in the Imam of his time as a divine guide with a mission of preserving the faith. For this reason, Muslim played the critical role of pre preparing the ground for Imam al Hussein's stand. Let us learn a lesson from Muslim ibn Aqil. How well do we understand the worldview of our Imams? And how in tune are we with their vision? L let us all take advantage of this Muharram and begin that lifelong journey. Because the Imam's worldview is our purpose in our mission, in our path, in our journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to this Never Forget program. As I've mentioned in previous nights, 
the Mainstay Foundation is holding six nightly programs throughout these 10 days. In addition, we are holding two additional programs, the Hussein Expressions and Hussein Service Day uh, that happened last Saturday, as well as supporting 12 other programs nationally. So these are the 14 programs, the 20 programs in total that we're supporting this, during this month. If you'd like to learn more about everything that the Mainstay Foundation does, you can read about us on our website, www.mainstay.us, or follow us on Instagram at Mainstay US. If you'd like to be part of this great effort and volunteer, you can see one of our volunteers, or you can see um, some of the volunteers at the table in the back. Now, again, one of our um, big projects that uh, we love and we always remember during these nights is our publications project that has been going on for over seven years, with 30 books published ranging from uh, spirituality to ethics to history and theology. And so if you'd like to continue on that journey of learning, please visit our table in the back uh, or go to amazon.com and search the Mainstay Foundation. Now, just released today by the Mainstay Publications team is My Awaited Journal. My Awaited Journal is a journal for you to write down your thoughts and your feelings and express them to our holy imam, the imam of our time. Whatever you're going through, the ups and downs, your thoughts, your failings, your feelings, your victories, you can write down letters to your imam in that journal as, a, as something between you and your imam, expressing your feelings and your love for your imam. Here is a, um, a sample copy of this journal. Um, this is just the, the case for it. This is the actual journal. So if you'd like to pick up one of these, they're available uh, at the table in the back. Uh, for our online viewers, uh, we're trying to get this online, inshallah, soon. Uh, but again, if you'd like to express your thoughts and your feelings and your, um, uh, and your sorrow for the Imam al-Hussein in these tragedies, to our, the Imam of our time, pick up one of these in the back, inshallah. Now, for what we've all come for, for the words of wisdom, and a reminder from Hajj Jalal Mughniya. Let's please welcome him with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. From Dua al ahd the supplication of the covenant, the pledge. O Lord of the great light, the Lord of the elevated throne, the Lord of the swollen ocean, the revealer of the Torah, the gospel, and the Psalms, the Lord of shade and heat, the revealer of the great Quran, and the Lord of the archangels, the prophets, and the messengers, I beseech you in your noble name, in the light of your luminous face and your eternal kingdom, O ever-living, I beseech you in your name with which the heavens and the earth have lit up, and in your name with which the past and the coming generations have become honorable. O he who always was alive before the existence of anything. O he who shall forever live after the extinction of everything. O oh, he who always was, even when there was nothing else. O oh, he who revives the dead and causes the living to die. O oh, ever living, there is no God but you. Ya Allah, convey to our master, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, the guide who is to fulfill your commands. May your blessings be upon him and his immaculate fathers on behalf of all of the believing men and women in the east and the west, in the plains, the mountains, the lands and the seas, and on behalf of my parents, convey to him blessings that are as weighty as your throne, and as much ink as of your words, and as many as that which is counted by your knowledge and encompassed by your book. Ya Allah, 
I renew for him in the beginning of this day and throughout the days of my life a pledge, a covenant, an allegiance to which I commit myself and from which I neither convert nor change. Ya Allah, make me of his supporters. Make me of his champions. Make me of those who hurry and fulfilling his directives. Make me of those who follow his commands, those who defend him, those who precede others in implementing his will, and those who, has, who shall fall as martyrs between his hands. Ya Allah, I ask you, if death that you have made inevitable and certain incumbent upon your servants stands between him and I, I ask you to take me out of my grave using my shroud as my dress, unsheathing my sword, and holding my lance in my hand and responding to the call of the caller who shall announce his advent in urban areas and deserts alike. Ya Allah, show me his magnificent presence and his praiseworthy brow. Delight my eyes by letting me have a look at him and expedite his relief. Make his reappearance easy. Clear a spacious place for him. Guide me to follow his course. Give success to his cause and confirm his strength. Ya Allah, construct your lands through him and refresh your servants by him. For you have said, and true are your words, corruption has appeared in the land and the sea on account of what the hands of men have brought. So Ya Allah, Show us your vicegerent, the son of your prophet, the namesake of your messenger. Peace and blessings be upon him and his family, so that he shall rip any wrong that he will face, and he shall confirm the truth. Ya Allah, make him the shelter to whom your wronged servants shall resort, the supporter of those who have no supporter save you, the reviver of the laws of your book, and the constructor of all of the signs of your religion, and the instructions of your messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Ya Allah, please include him with those whom you protect from the domination of the aggressors. Ya Allah, Please delight your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, as well as all of those who followed him in his proclamation by making us see him. And please have mercy upon us after our dishonor after him. Ya Allah, please relieve our community from the current grief through presenting him and expedite his advent for us. Surely they see him as far away but we know him to be near. Do this all in your name, O merciful of the most merciful. Salawat. Brothers and sisters, we come here tonight yet again with an opportunity. Because every day, every day, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to take yet another breath, fills our lungs with airs, to speak words of truth, and the most beautiful words being La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, to testify that there is no God but He, the One, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is His Prophet and His Messenger. This is yet an, another opportunity for you and I, brothers and sisters, to claim our place within the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I ask you to hold a copy of the Holy Quran if you brought it with you tonight. Yes. Those are the courageous ones. Those are the brave ones. For those of you who did not bring a copy of the Holy Quran, I'm not going to say you're not courageous and you're not brave. But I will say you are missing on an opportunity. But guess what? You still have a chance. Why? Because you're still here. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and Lady Fatima alayhi salam, and the Imam of our time, they love you. And they want to hear your voice. And they want you to come forward and testify your belief. So if you don't have a copy of the Holy Quran, I wish for you to raise your right hand up high, as high as you can. As high as you can. This, by the way, this is for you. This is for us. This is for me. I'm going to raise my hand as high as I can. Are you with me? 
You with me? Allah is my Lord. Allah is my Lord. Allah is my Lord. Islam is my religion. Islam is my religion. Islam is my religion. The Quran is my book. The Quran is my book. The Quran is my book. Muhammad is my prophet. Muhammad is my prophet. Muhammad is my prophet. Ali is my Imam. Ali is my Imam. Ali is my Imam. Ahsantum, salawat. For you to say, Allah is my Lord, Islam is my religion, the Quran is my book, Muhammad is my prophet, Ali is my Imam. Do you know how many people gave their lives for you and I to have the honor to say those words? Do you know how many generations have committed themselves so that you and I can utter those words, whether you knowingly see their significance or not, you are still uttering those words. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and his companions that fell martyr on the day of Ashura, and all of the generations after that Imam sacrificing their lives for us to be able to stand over a thousand years later, still strong in our faith saying la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah the protectors the guardians of that testament la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah are the giants upon whom we stand on their shoulders you and i brothers and sisters when we're examining history every single night we are looking at those individuals those giants so don't take lightly what you're able to say now in comfort. For people gave their blood so that you can know what it means to say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I want you to understand that. I want you to see how rich your history is. This history that we're talking about every single night is your history. It's not something from a distant land far away that you're detached from. I want you to build a relationship with this history because it is yours. It is your identity that lies in this history. Keep that in mind. I want you to feel it. I want you to think about it. This is your history. Don't take that lightly. When people ask you, what's your name? And you say your name is Ali. When you say your name is Muhammad. When you say your name is Fatima. Your name is Zahra. Your name is Haidar. Oh, you belong to a history, my friend. You're not shallow, you're not superficial. And even if you think you are, I want you to challenge yourself. Even if people think that you're superficial, you're shallow. Even if you look in the mirror and you're having second thoughts, who am I really? I want you to challenge yourself. In these nights, I want you to challenge yourself. Every single night. Every single night. Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam after 25 years, the nation that had initially looked at others and chose them for political leadership finally came to the doors of Imam Ali alayhi salam after the first, the second, and the third caliphates. These administrations collectively came to what became about 25 years, just shy of it. So in 657 AD, Imam Ali alayhi salam at the assassination of Uthman, the third caliph, the people came to Imam Ali alayhi salam and they told him, Ya Ali, we want you to lead. Imam Ali alayhi salam, what was his initial response? Go and find someone else. I'm better for you as counsel than I am as chief. Ya Ali, what do you mean? You're the best amongst us. We want you to lead. He repeated, I am better for you as counsel than I am as chief. Go and seek someone else. In fact, he told the individual that was coming to him, because the individuals that came to him, amongst the many, were Talha and Zubair. And we're going to talk about these individuals who were companions of the Prophet. They came and they told him, Ya Ali, we want you to lead. 
He even told Talha, how about you take the position? We're going to examine this period of history very closely inshallah. And I want you to realize, in examining this history, we're going to be seeing both theologically and ethically the way we look at Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib because of what he did, he tells us how to look at him. Don't bring your own political, socio-political paradigm in which you examine Imam Ali alayhi salam or any of our Imams. We need to be looking at our Imams in a way that they show us what they wanted in the world. Everything that you will see from Ahlul Bayt emphasized one thing. And that was Islam. That was La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and nothing else. So whatever came to protect Islam and as a derivative of protecting Islam was protecting the lives of the believers. Protecting the religion and protecting the blood, the lives, the sanctity of life. So you will see from the Holy Prophet all the way to our Imam, the Imam of our time, this emphasis on the sanctity of the religion, the sanctity of life. Brother, if you're not going to pay attention, please go to the back. Because you're distracting me. The sanctity of the religion and the sanctity of life. Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, and the rest of our Imams, that entire movement was on those two very things. So if you look at the movement of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam when it came to the day of Ashura, people asked, what was the Imam doing? What was he doing? He made it clear, I have not come to claim power or authority or governance. I have not come for fame, but rather I have come for islah fi ummati jaddi. I have come for reform in the nation of my grandfather. Meaning what? That community of believers, that religion of Rasulullah, he came for that. Just like his brother Al Hassan, just like his father Amir al Mu'mineen, just like his grandfather Rasulullah. When we look at Imam Ali alayhi salam and we see this emphasis on the rights of people, this emphasis on the sanctity of faith and life, and the emphasis on just governance, when we're looking today at social justice initiatives, and we're seeing how do we engage with the issues of our time today. Look no further than Amir al muminin alayhi salam to see how entrenched he was in his society and what he provided. Not only when he was at the helm as the Khalifa, but also as a private citizen. Imam Ali alayhi salam was always a part of the process. He was always integrated in the system, even in systems that were oppressive to him. Keep that in mind. Why? There was a goal, there was an objective, there was a vision to do what? To do what? To serve Islam, protect Islam, protect people. You and I, brothers and sisters, what's our vision? What's our objective? What's our goal? When you're going to your job, you're having a career, your university, you're, wherever you are, are you going with a vision, with a mission? What is it about? You are living your life in what way? How are you designing your life? Because guess what? What we understand from Ahlul Bayt السلام, what we are enfranchised with from the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, is that we are the captains of our ship. We are the warriors of our battlefield. We are the ones who are in control. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us that free will so that we can choose our lives. And we can make happen whatever it is that we want to make happen in our life. If you look at Imam Ali alayhi salam, the way he engaged, he told them, I am better for you as counsel than I am as chief. But they insisted, Ya Ali, we want you to lead. So much so that so many people came to Imam Ali alayhi salam in 657 AD that the majority of the people of the nation, of the ummah, of the empire, would essentially come and pick Imam Ali. Arguably, Imam Ali alayhi salam was the first elected, elected political ruler of the Arabs and the Muslims. They came out for Imam Ali alayhi salam in swarms. So finally, Imam Ali alayhi salam said, fine. What did he agree to? He agreed to doing the same thing that he was doing all along. 
that I will do whatever is in the best affairs of the people. I will do whatever is in the best interest of the people. So though Imam Ali السلام, at this time, he did agree, this khilafa that the Imam came to wasn't the khilafa that completed his imama. Know the difference. The khilafa does not complete Imam Ali السلام. He was always the Imam. He was always fulfilling his role. But at this point in time, in this history, in this place, the people wished for him to rule, and he said, I will rule by the condition that I rule like the Prophet led, and I will enjoin in good and forbid the evil. So Imam Ali السلام, became the Khalifa. The Imam ruled for four and a half years. In those four and a half years, Imam Ali السلام, faced three major civil wars, three battles. The Battle of Jamal, Safin, and Nahrawan. The first challengers that came up against him were who? The widow of the Prophet Aisha, Talha and Zubair. Remember those two individuals, Talha and Zubair? They were of the individuals that first came to Imam Ali السلام, to bring him into that position of rulership, asking him to lead. But soon enough, motivations changed. People were going forward with different things. And months later, you found a campaign that was making its way from Al Hijaz, Arabia, into Iraq, from southern Iraq, Basra. And Aisha, Talha, and Zubair began rallying up people against Imam Ali alayhi salam and waged that first battle against him. Now, we mention this even though it is a very sensitive time in history. And even these individuals, when we look at across the schools of thought in Islam, these are revered individuals. So when we're approaching this conversation, it's not to entice any type of sectarianism. And I want us as followers of Ahlul Bayt to understand, this is not a Shi'i Sunni discourse. This is a discourse on Muslims or from Muslims understanding Islam. You as Shia belong to the body of Islam just like any other Muslim. Just like anyone else that says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And in fact, as by the directives of our maraja. Specifically, I'll give you an example from the late Marja, Grand Ayatollah, Sayyid Muhammad Sa'id al-Hakim, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, the one who passed away in September of last year. He emphasized to all of the youth that would come and visit him from the West, especially here in the United States. I remember a gathering that I was sitting in the holy city of Najaf, in his humble home, in which he was talking to us and telling us, you as Shia, as followers of Ahlul Bayt, Make sure when you are engaging in any kind of discourse, you're not detaching yourself or making yourself to be outside of the body of Islam. Because as followers of Ahlul Bayt, your role is to do what? The way we understand it is we are to protect Islam. So we're belonging to this conversation within Islam, not outside of it. Not something that's different. Keep that in mind, brothers and sisters. Because when we engage in this history, it's not meant to do anything of a controversial nature, but rather so we can understand what happened and understand why we are here where we are today. When Imam Ali السلام, faced off with these individuals, he continued to remind them of the Prophet. Why are we so obsessed with Imam Ali السلام? Why do we revere him so much? Because every step of the way, in every single thing he did, he said, Rasulullah, Rasulullah, Rasulullah. That was his compass. Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. That was his compass. So of course I'm going to be obsessed with this individual because even these individuals that were coming forward, who were companions and a widow of the Prophet, Imam Ali alayhi salam reminded them, what did the Prophet tell you, Talha? What did the Prophet tell you, O Aisha? What did the Prophet tell you, O Zubair? And reminded them that the Prophet had even instructed them before he passed away that be wary of the time when it will come in which you will stand against Ali. Finally, the time came 25 years later. Two decades and a half years later, the time came when they were opposing Imam Ali alayhi salam. Zubair left the battle before it began. Talha continued in the war. 
he was killed in the battle by Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan ibn al-Hakam was on his side. He shot him with an arrow on his back. Aisha survived. How did Imam Ali alayhi salam, when the battle was all done and over, how did he deal with Aisha, the widow of the Prophet? Imam Ali alayhi salam, had her escorted with honor and dignity by her own brother, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, who was her younger brother, and she didn't even realize who the escort was because he was covered in his armor, his helmet. She began complaining, how is it that Ali has me escorted by strange men? He removed his helmet and he showed my sister Aisha, it is only me. So even with the individuals that wish to kill Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, clarifying for us what? He engaged only with grace. Only with grace. From Talha, Zubair and Aisha in the battle of Jamal to Muawiyah and Safin. Amir al muminin never at any point with any of these individuals said, because you are fighting me, because I am the Imam, because I am the Khalifa, you're fighting me, you're no longer a Muslim. Imam Ali salam had no problem clarifying the rules of engagement even with Muslims. Showing us what? That today, brothers and sisters, when we have any kind of difference or conflict, how do we engage? Do we do takfir? Do we oust people from our religion and say, this person is an infidel, this person is murtad, this person doesn't belong to our faith because we disagree in their beliefs or in their creed? Absolutely not. Imam Ali alayhi salam still treated them as Muslims. You and I need to reflect on that. If it comes in these matters where there's a battle, thousands of people were killed. And mind you, every moment of engagement, Imam Ali alayhi salam would tell the other side, let no lives be lost today. Fight me if you wish to take. Fight me if you wish to take. In the battle of Safin against Muawiyah, Imam Ali alayhi salam calls Muawiyah out into the middle of the battlefield. And he says, O Muawiyah, let no man die today. You have a challenge to me? And you wish to become the Khalifa? You wish to challenge me? Come and fight me. And Muawiyah could do no such thing because he knew. He knew who Imam Ali alayhi salam was. Now when we come to examine Imam Ali alayhi salam, brothers and sisters, we're not just seeing an individual who on the battlefield had the greatest courage and bravery and valor. Imam Ali alayhi salam was the manifestation of all of manhood. All of Futuwa was in Ali ibn Abi Talib. When the Holy Prophet said, لا سيف إلا ذو الفقار ولا فتى إلا علي لا فتى إلا علي ولا سيف إلا ذو الفقار There is no youth Meaning there's no man but Ali And no sword but ذو الفقار Whose sword was ذو الفقار? It was Ali's The entire statement was about Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam The Prophet singing the praises of Ali ibn Abi Talib How could I not be obsessed with Ali ibn Abi Talib? When my prophet, when my prophet was obsessed with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Brothers and sisters, Imam Ali alayhi salam had no problem on the battlefield, just like he had no problem in the marketplace. So you and I, when we're examining and we're seeing, where is our battlefield? Definitely it's here. Definitely it's here. Imam Ali alayhi salam He's walking in the marketplace. He's the Khalifa at this time. Mind you, when he walked in the marketplace, he didn't wear the fanciest of clothing. He didn't walk around with an entourage. He didn't have people holding him on their shoulders like a monarch. This time, Imam Ali alayhi salam ruled over hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even millions. He was the ruler of this time. He walked in the marketplace like any ordinary man, undetected by the people. One day, he sees an elderly man begging, going up to each person, please help me. Sir, can you spare some change? Can you help me? 
I barely have clothes on my back, any food to eat. I don't have family. Help me. No one paid him any attention. Nothing at all. No attention whatsoever. Everyone ignored him. Imam Ali was just watching the scene. And he's watching everybody else. Can you imagine that? A man is begging. Imam Ali is in the marketplace. Watching him beg. Watching the people ignore him. Finally the Imam, after seeing that no one is helping him, he says, What is this? One of the people around says, eh, it's just a Christian. Just a Christian? Just a Christian? Imam Ali alayhi salam, the narration tells us that he became physically angry. He said, how dare you use this man up in his youth and then neglect him in his old age? Go to the treasury at once and take care of every single one of his needs. Just a Christian. That was Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. He would be unable to turn a blind eye to a man that suffered, even though he did not belong to the same faith as him. How many of us turn a blind eye to one another, even though we belong to the same school of thought? With Imam Ali alayhi salam. Following Ali ibn Abi Talib, being a follower of Islam, a follower of Rasulullah, it means what? Your heart moves with the suffering of your fellow man, regardless of their belief or their faith. When we mentioned that you were to treat people as one of two kinds, your brother in faith or your equal in humanity, that's not just something that you post up on your social media. You put in a nice graphic and you wait for people to see how many likes and shares you get so that you can engage in some type of interfaith exchange. This is what we, believe, we live by. This is our philosophy. Imam Ali alayhi salam would not stand for any person to suffer. You know those battles that we were just talking about? Jamal, Safin, Nahrawan. Imam Ali alayhi salam, after each one of these battles, any chance he could get, he would go and visit the widows and the orphans of those battles. Oh, I'm not talking about the widows and the orphans of his own soldiers. I'm talking about the widows and the orphans of the other side. Imam Ali alayhi salam, one day he's visiting a household that their father was killed in one of the battles. The woman is caring for her three children. He asked her, do you need some help? Can I help you with some things? She said, you know what? I'm trying to make food and wash these clothes for these kids. Do you mind just maybe playing with the kids, giving them some company? She didn't know who he was. He just seemed like a nice man. And she was overwhelmed. So Imam Ali alayhi salam is playing with these kids. And as he's playing with these kids, all he hears is her cursing the name Ali ibn Abi Talib. It was Ali that took away the father of my children. It was Ali that took away the love of my life. It was Ali that caused the hardship of this home. Imam Ali alayhi salam did not utter a word. One of the narrations says, it wasn't until the Imam left and came back multiple times and then another family member saw and was just in pure astonishment and then told her, do you know who's been at your home? This is the Khalifa Ali ibn Abi Talib. But of course, this isn't an astonishment to the people that know Ali. Why? Because he was the shadow of Rasulullah. Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, when he was on his mission in administering and delivering la ilaha illallah to the people that, to the people that threw filth on him on a daily basis, he would care for them. He would be there for them. And he would smile when they said, how could you treat us with such kindness, O Muhammad? وَمَا بُعْثْتُ 
I was not sent except to perfect the best of ethics. O oh Muhammad, and you are nothing but a mercy to all of mankind. Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam from Lady Fatima and Imam Ali alayhi salam to Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein and to all of our Imams until our 12th awaited Imam, Al Imam al Mahdi, Ajalallahu ta'ala farajahu al Sharif. They are all an extension of that mercy, and you and I continue to benefit from that rahmah, rahmatan lil alameen, to this day, the sun behind the clouds. No matter how cloudy it is, brothers and sisters, no matter how gloomy life may seem, the sun always shines. So you and I, let's say tonight we are inspired by these stories, we're inspired by the justice of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the mercy of Ali ibn Abi Talib, what he brought forward in unity and community, even with those that wanted to kill him, but he still gave them respect, honor, and dignity. You and I, how do we take that into our lives? Beyond some of the simple ways that we've tied here tonight. Every night, I want you to continue analyzing with me. Not just hear a story, that's nice, and move forward. How do you take that into your own life? How do you make it where you are a walking reflection of the lessons and the legacy of Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib salam? Because if you're going to come here and just shed tears over Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, beautiful, great, you're getting a lot of blessings. I'm not going to come up here and tell you, oh, you shedding your tears over Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is not enough. La bilakis. Shedding tears over Imam Hussein alayhi salam is the greatest blessing. There's nothing greater than that. The blessing of shedding tears over Imam Hussein alayhi salam, our Imams tell us the great bounties and rewards that are come, that come through shedding those tears. But you and I, brothers and sisters, if we want more in implementing and transforming our lives, let's take some reflection. Let's shed the tears and then reflect. Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, when he did what he did and he established what he established, he was showing us a standard of just governance and just living. So, you and I, when we're questioning, how do I engage with people? What if this person wronged me? What if I'm in the right? Do I have a right? Do I have a right here? Absolutely, you have a right. How many of us have entered in arguments or in conflict, in transactions with family members, friends, business? No, no, I have a right here. No, 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 I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let go. Imam Ali alayhi salam, from the first day after Rasulullah, people took away his rights. Imam Ali alayhi salam, for 25 years, he was letting go of his rights. And in fact, even when the day came, when the people said, we want you to lead, he said, no, no, no. No, thank you. You're not returning my right. You're not in a position to give it to me. Just like you were never in a position to take it away. You're not in a position to give it to me because you were never in a position to take it away from the beginning. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet, a divine command. Now I will lead for what? Just based on the same principle that I stood back and I advised from the background. To protect the affairs of the people so long as it is what? Only a transgression on my personal rights. So you and I, brothers and sisters, maybe let's practice a little humility when it comes to our rights. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he gave up his personal rights so you and I can still say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah because if Ali fought those men even though he had the right to. Islam perished, gone. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he explains to his companions. They asked him, oh Ali, why didn't you fight? He said, the Prophet gave me instructions to protect Islam. Islam was too young. Islam was in its infancy and it required sacrifice. You and I, if we are to consider ourselves ambassadors of our faith, and again, my greatest respect to my sisters who wear the flag of Islam on their heads, 
they're the first ambassadors on the front lines. And we owe them the greatest respect and the greatest honor. And we need to support them. Why? It's difficult. It's not easy. As men, as brothers, we need to have the courage, the honor, the chivalry to have respect for our sisters. We as a community need to stand together and realize are we ambassadors of this truth or not? It's our choice. What do you want to be an ambassador of? What do you want to represent? What do you want to be your life's work? I'll tell you what my life's work is. Or at least what I'm trying. At least what I'm trying to make my life's work. It's serving this. Serving Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, Ajalallahu ta'ala faraj al Sharif. You want to be an ambassador of that? And of course, disclaimer no one's saying ambassador of the Imam in the literal sense of ambassador of the Imam. The ambassador door has closed after Ghayb al Sughra. Closed. But in the sense of trying to follow the Imam and serve him and being an ambassador of his legacy in that sense, that is what we are yearning for. Do you want to be an ambassador? Then you need to know who are you fighting for? Who are you striving for? Who are you living for? It's our choice. The Imam, it was always clear for him. His companions, always clear for them. The companions of the Imams are so beautiful when we look at their stories. Look at the example of Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir, mind you, this man went through so much trouble, so much trial, and so much triumph. Ammar ibn Yasir, from the early days of the Prophet, he was one of the first Muslims in Islam. Ammar ibn Yasir, his experience was actually the first display of taqiyya in Islam, which the Prophet endorsed. Taqiyya being pious dissimulation, and I'll explain. Ammar ibn Yasir, in the early days, before the hijrah, he was captured, he was caught, by the Qarashis, by the pagans of Quraysh, the pagans of Mecca. And they beat him, and they beat him, and they beat him so severely, Ammar almost died. And as they were beating him, they were saying, Ammar, say you do not believe in Muhammad. Ammar, say you do not believe in Allah. And they would beat him and beat him and beat him, bloodied from head to toe. Finally, Ammar, with barely lungs in his, with barely br any breath, any air in his lungs, he would say, I don't believe. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the freedom that we have, you and I, brothers and sisters, the safety that we have? What was I saying earlier? Don't take for granted saying, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There were people that gave their lives for that. Ammar ibn Yasir, he tried to hold on and hold on and hold on until he couldn't breathe anymore. And he said, I don't believe. Then they laughed and they let him go. And then Ammar ran to the Prophet crying. He said, Ya Rasulullah. <laughs> Barely able to gather the words. The Prophet tells him, Ammar. It's okay. Be calm. What happened? And the people explained the situation to the Prophet. And he embraced Ammar and he said, Ammar, has faith left your heart? He said, no, Ya Rasulullah. Never. Never will it leave my heart. He said, Ammar, you did the right thing. We need you alive. The sanctity of life, brothers and sisters. The sanctity of life. So Rasulullah would say, the sanctity of the life of a believer is greater than the sanctity of the Kaaba itself. Know that. That's your sanctity. That's your value. That's how much you matter. Ammar ibn Yasir would go on and continue to honor La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah even in the most challenging times. During the rule of Uthman, the third caliph, he would challenge him and tell him, Uthman, you're going about this all wrong, man. What's going on? This nepotism, this materialism, 
you're putting, we get it, you're putting your family members in positions, but all of the positions? And he was vocal. So much so that Ammar would take yet another beating. But now by the Khalifa of the Muslims. Ironic. But Ammar would triumph. And he would fight alongside Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam until his last breath. Those were the companions of Ali. Abu Dhar al-Ghafari who also passed away, what? Out of exile during the, th the third caliphate. Because he was vocal against that. All of the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, all of these individuals that committed themselves to La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, they knew what they represented. They knew what they were following. They knew what they were doing. They had clear vision. But guess what, brothers and sisters? It didn't just come out of thin air. They worked at it day in, day out. They surrounded themselves with like-minded individuals. They built a community, even within a community. So if you find yourself struggling and seeing, how do I commit myself to a life that I wish to live truly? How can I really be the captain of my own ship? How can I choose a lifestyle that is going to make me better? Spiritually, physically, intellectually, socially, emotionally. Where's your community? Where's your tribe? Where's your family? And I'm not asking you about your biological family. May Allah protect all of your families. I'm not asking you about the tribe, your ashira. That's not what I'm asking about. I'm asking about the people that you choose to surround yourself with. Guess what? The Prophet ﷺ created for the Muslims a new family, a new tribe. But he didn't dismantle the connections that they had with their biological ties. Tie these things together. As Muslims and followers of Ahlul Bayt السلام, we do not isolate and disassociate from society. We're still part of our society. We want to be part of our society. But there's also a choice that you and I, as much as we respect and honor and love and dignify our families, you have the choice to build a family, a tribe, a community that is like-minded and harmonious in building the life that you want to build. Does that make sense? Are you connecting? I want for us to be able to build on that path and be with those that are the companions of the Imams together as a harmonious mind because we can and we will. It's our choice. But if you completely defer this to outside forces and you say, well, you know, I don't have time, I'm too busy, you know, life. Oh, how are you doing? Well, you know, school, work, you know, just busy. If you want to continue your life that way, listen, that's up to you. That's your free will. But guess what? You are responsible and you are accountable. And I'm not trying to scare you in the sense you're responsible, you're accountable, you're going to answer to Allah. You will. But you are also going to face yourself in the mirror and see, this is how I spent it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all He wants for you is for you to see you have a choice. You are empowered. You have agency. You can choose to ignore like everybody else did in that marketplace. Or you can be like Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, and do what? Imam Ali السلام, was not just merely a vocal person. Billah. Imam Ali السلام, was a man of action. Meaning what? When it required for him, and it was the best option to make a vocal note of it, he did. But many a times Imam Ali alayhi salam worked silently and quietly. In fact, the majority of his life, you would see a silent, quiet movement of justice. So you and I, when we're choosing whether we're going to be holding up signs and protesting, if you wish to do that, that's fine. That's your right. Here in the United States, you have free speech. Go, use it. But what is more effective? What will actually bring the justice that you're looking for? Bring the aid that you want to bring forth. Bring the help that is necessary for the people in need. Think about it. Because what's required of us, brothers and sisters, to be effective 
at the end of the day, if we want to understand one of the great wisdoms of Ahlul Bayt السلام, it is to see that they were effective. Whether they were at the helm of political rulership or they were private citizens usurped of their rights, they were always effective. Tonight, brothers and sisters, we have the honor in realizing a role of being an ambassador to remember an individual who manifested this role so beautifully. And that was the ambassador of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, Muslim ibn Aqil. When I'm thinking, what do I want to represent? Who do I want to represent? Who do I love? Should be my next question. What do I love? Because you can't represent something without loving it. You can't be there for someone and manifest what they want without loving them. We find that from Ahlul Bayt and specifically from Muslim ibn Aqil, this relationship of love that he had for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. What's most peculiar, brothers and sisters, was that with Muslim ibn Aqil, at one point, people thought that a revolution was taking place with the response that was had in the city of Kufa. And mind you, the, the city of Kufa, the people of Kufa, did not betray Imam al Hussein alayhi salam as sometimes it is said. Meaning the people of Kufa, many of them were loyal to Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. The greater picture is what? That so many, just like the other companions, just like the other people that were followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, so many of them were killed. So many of them were imprisoned. So many of them were beaten so severely and threatened and blackmailed with their families. That they could not come to the aid of Imam al-Hussein. And the history is a lot deeper than just a oversight of or an oversimplification of Kufa betrayed al Hussein. It makes for a nice slogan. But I want us, inshallah, in these coming nights to look further and deeper into the history and see what truly happened. Because Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, with Kufa, Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib, Kufa was home to him. Imam al Hassan, Kufa was home to him. Imam al Hussein. There were many lovers and admirers of Ahlul Bayt salam from Kufa. And many of the people that came later on wanting to avenge the killing of Imam al Hussein salam came from Kufa. So, inshallah, tonight, brothers and sisters, as we remember Muslim ibn Aqil. Let us reflect on this role of being an ambassador of the Imam and serving the Imam with love. If I tell you this tale of sorrow, will you lend me your hearts to borrow? Will you shed a tear for Hussein? Will you remember Zainab's pain? If I tell you this tale of sorrow, Will you lend me your hearts to borrow? Will you shed a tear for Hussein? Will you remember Zainab's pain? And if we stay here tonight until tomorrow, will you bear this tale of sorrow? Listen here to Hussein's story, a story of heartache. And glory, a story of heartache and glory. Before the day of Ashura, before the battle of Karbala, Imam al Hussein, 
would send his cousin Muslim ibn Aqil as his ambassador to Kufa. When the people of Kufa found out that Imam al Hussein would not give allegiance to Yazid, they began writing letters to Imam al Hussein, hundreds, then thousands. Some saying that over 20,000 letters would reach Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein would tell his cousin Muslim, I wish for you to go to Kufa as my ambassador and confirm the loyalty of the people of Kufa. So Muslim would place his hand on his chest and bow his head before the Imam and say to the Imam, I'm at your every command, Sayyidi Hussein. Muslim ibn Aqil would embark on the journey to Kufa. And as he entered the city of Kufa, the people welcomed him in swarms. They say that thousands of men filled the courtyard of the capital of Kufa and welcomed Muslim ibn Aqil like a hero, all calling out, their support for Imam al Hussein, calling out to Muslim, Labbaik, Labbaik, Labbaik. As Muslim saw these men welcoming him, meeting with the chiefs of the tribes, each one coming one after the other, saying their allegiance to Imam al Hussein. Muslim was reassured by their loyalty. So he wrote back to Imam al Hussein telling him, Sayyidi Ya Aba Abdullah, the people await you. The people are here for you. Come forth at once. Brothers and sisters, the days passed and a new governor was appointed by Yazid to replace the current governor of Kufa. The new governor was Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad. Yazid didn't want to hear anything left from the current governor of Kufa. He wanted someone to rule over the people with an iron fist. So he chose this alliance with Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad, the governor of Basra. So Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad would move from Basra to Kufa and he would come into the city of Kufa veiled on his head, not letting anyone know who he was, disguising himself with a black turban and a black veil. People thought that when he entered the city of Kufa that he was Imam al Hussein. He entered and he rode into the city of Kufa, into the palace. And he came inside and he tricked the people. And one by one, he allowed his soldiers, his commanders to come and take control of the city quietly. Until Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, after many schemes and many maneuvers on the people of Kufa, some were assassinated, some were killed, some were taken as prisoner and thrown in jails. Some were exiled and some were bribed and some were blackmailed. Within these days and these weeks, Ubaidullah had a stronghold over the people of Kufa. Muslim ibn Aqil would find himself surrounded. In those days, Muslim ibn Aqil would find himself surrounded by the forces of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Muslim would not give up until his final breath. As he was surrounded, being pelted by arrows and spears and rocks, he would continue to fight dozens of men until they finally brought him to his knees. 
Muslim ibn Aqil was taken to the palace and brought forward to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Dragged to the palace. He told him point blank, O oh Muslim, you will be killed today. Do you have any last words? Brothers and sisters, Muslim didn't think about his sons. He didn't think about his family. He didn't think about anyone. But Imam al As Muslim Ibn Aqil was taken to the rooftop of the palace before they would behead him. Muslim Ibn Aqil would ask them, Before they would take Muslim Ibn Aqil's head, Muslim only had one thing to say, and he would call out, Assalamu alayka Sayyidi Ya Muslim would be beheaded, his body thrown from the rooftop, dragged through the city of Kufa for the people to see. When the news came to Imam al Hussein as he was journeying towards Iraq, Imam al Hussein was so disheartened but he didn't keep the news from his men he didn't keep the news from his people he told them what happened to Muslim Ibn Aqil he recited his tragedy he told them that my brother my cousin my ambassador Muslim was killed but brothers and sisters Imam al Hussein was telling the adults, he was telling his men, he was telling the men that would be his soldiers when he went back to his tent. They say that Muslim had a young daughter, her name was Hamida. She came up to her uncle Hussein and she told him, I'm Ya Hussein. Have you heard any news about my father Muslim? I'm Ya Hussein. Is my father near? I'm Ya Hussein. Will I see my father soon? And Imam Al Hussein holds this young girl and he tells her, Ya Hamida. I am your father now. Hamida confused as Imam Al Hussein is touching her hand. She says, Oh, Uncle Hussein, why are you looking at me like this? He says, Oh, Hamida, your father Muslim is gone. I will be your father now. Brothers and sisters, Hamida with her weak voice, she calls out, Ya Muslim, O oh Father. Where have you gone, left me an orphan?